Welcome in to the Ots and Audibles podcast. Matt Prem, Jared Mack, Eric Scopel on today's show. It's a Monday. It's a mailbag Monday. Got a lot to talk about. Uh, probably a lot of this is going to be built around Oregon's edition of Dylan Gabriel and maybe what comes next or what this means for long-term prospects for the team. Beyond that, uh, plus a, little, a couple other things uh, you're throwing about. It, it's always a crazy time, Eric, uh, for the mailbag. I looked at your responses, and there was like 40 of them, which – this is the type of year where there's so much uncertainty and the mailbag is so awesome because we could go in many different ways because there's so many things to talk about. You're right. And we had a ton of submissions and a lot of them we didn't use. Obviously, we usually do five or six on the show. Um, so guys that if you send out a question, and we're not talking about it. Keep sending those out. We're going to keep doing the mailbags on Monday. Um, obviously, things are subject to change, but there are a lot of topics that we, we just couldn't get to today. So I apologize for that. But Keep sending them out. We're going to start with a question from at Connor Cook 21. Thank you guys for all you do. Always a great listen. What is your confidence level that Dante Moore could come sit for a year to develop and take over in 2025? If you think it's a if you think it's low, then where do you think they pivot to set up the room for the future? Hashtag uh, it's not audibles. Obviously, flattery gets you everywhere in life. That's what we started with Connor, who told us we did a great job. Thank you, Connor. I appreciate that. Um, I I couldn't find Matt a really great. Let's talk about Dylan Gabriel question. It's funny because the, the you know the I posted the prompt twenty four hours after he right. committed, and everybody had moved on to other things. But <laughs> let's start with. I know you had Matt Zenitz on, yeah, the podcast directly after on Saturday, but neither Jared or I have had a chance really to react. Let's just do a quick run through on our Dylan Gabriel um, edition responses from from Jared and I. I'll let Jared go first, and then we can jump into the whole Dante Moore of it all. Just because I thought we'd start talking about the, the sure. quarterback position on today's show, even though there wasn't a Dylan specific one that really stood out. Yeah, uh, quarterback, pretty important position. Um, yeah, I've been on the podcast this this oh. past week talking about uh, Dylan Gabriel and Cam Ward and how my overall preference was Cam Ward, but it's not like Dylan Gabriel was some consolation prize. It was just more of a personal thing. They're both very talented quarterbacks. Um, I think Gabriel is going to fit in quite well into Will Stein's offense. Uh, I think a lot of quarterbacks would, but I think Gabriel, with his experience and his quick motion and his uh, accuracy within the 10 to 20-yard range, um, is very really is really beneficial to what Will Stein likes to do. Um, obviously, he likes to throw it deep every once in a while, but you know, Bo Nix's best uh, abilities were able to get the ball to guys in open space and let them do the work. And that was either sometimes it was behind the line of scrimmage, sometimes it was over the middle. But um, yeah, a lot of these were tight window throws that he made look really easy. Uh, I think Dylan Gabriel does a good job of that as well. Uh, at Oklahoma, I felt like at times their offensive line struggled. Um, at Oregon, depending on who returns, specifically Jackson Powers Johnson, um, they might not have a problem with that. Um, I'm pretty sure we all feel confident in a Johnny Cornelius's return um, with him and then and, and Josh, Josh Connolly Jr. at the tackle position. Like that's a good, at least standard base for whoever does decide to return. Um, and that's going to help Dylan Gabriel a lot. Like, yeah, he can use his legs, but it's not that he's um what Jane Daniels was sure. he's you know he's running for like under 400 yards a season like that's what Bo Nix did this past year he did a little bit more of that his first season at Oregon like everybody remembers the, the touchdown run he had against Texas in the in the Red River rivalry and there was, and people think that he's just this excellent runner like he can get it done with his legs but he's going to be more of a pocket passer he's going to be more of a guy who has the ability to get out and run if need be like Bo Nix does. And I think that's really good. I think all like all elite quarterbacks have that capability. Um, and I think this should just be another um, off season where Oregon feels really damn good about their team heading into the next regular season. Uh, I think that this guy is really good. I think that he's going to come in uh, probably soon and learn the offense and learn everybody's names and learn everything he has to, to to take this team to the next level. I think Oregon Oregon fans should feel really good about this addition. And despite what the 24-7 sports rankings say, oh. I don't feel like there are seven quarterbacks better than him oh. in the transfer portal. So sorry, company that employs me and hands me my checks, but you're wrong in this instance. 
It's funny you bring that up because I wanted to mention that too because I found that really surprising. I, and I understand because some of it's upside and you're talking about Aiden Childs and Dante And Ward. why is Cam Ward the third best quarterback in the country? Because he only has one more year of eligibility. Granted, that does give me the benefit of the doubt of saying, yes, no, Cam Ward is the better quarterback. Good, good call, Jared. But I, I still think it's silly. I, I agree. And I think what's exciting here if you're an Oregon fan is – it keeps you on footing for where you just were because what yeah. what Oregon's lost this most recent, not that long ago, uh, that was tough to swallow. This puts you in a spot here where obviously a new conference, new set of obstacles, but you should have the play at quarterback to continue to contend for a championship. And now with the comp, you know, with college football playoff expanding to 12 teams, theoretically, I think you can consider yourself in that kind of a conversation. We should note um, several websites had like their, way too early looks at the Heisman Trophy. Uh, Dylan Gabriel was listed on several of those. So um, I'm not sure he'll have a year like Bo had because what I think we just saw was really spectacular and extremely special. Um, but I do think it's possible he's in that conversation and he's one of the best co quarterbacks in the Big Ten. Like I think entering the season right now, you look at it and you go, they have J.J. McCarthy. We will see what exactly happens at Ohio State. That sounds like it. maybe that's the Cam Ward destination. Um, but Dylan Gabriel puts you on par with all of these programs right now and, and probably better than a lot of the ones you're competing with. So I think this is a really uh, significant addition to get it done so early, a week into the portal basically being open. They already have their quarterback. That's significant. I know Jared brought up that part in terms of building out a portal class. It's great to have a guy to build around with, with Gabriel. So I think this is a really significant start. Um, Jared covered a lot of the things I like here as well. Um, one thing I will be curious on is on my analysis piece, I wrote that Bo Nix is the more accurate quarterback. I'll be curious to see how Dylan Gabriel and his completion percentage changes in this scheme. Because somebody brought up a good point of, of Bo's was about the same percentage when he was at Auburn. And then he came over to Oregon and it skyrocketed. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see Gabriel, who if you go back and watch a lot of what he does, some similarities in terms of his skill set there. I could see him being a guy who's in the, 72 and above percentage range, perhaps, you know, maybe in the low 70s, high 60s. I think he's got the ability to be a very accurate quarterback as well. And as he's proven, doesn't turn the ball over, consistent in terms of getting the ball to the right guy. A lot of the same kind of attributes you like with Bo, I think you'll see with, with Dylan. When you have one of the best quarterbacks in college football, it kind of overcomes a lot of your other weaknesses. And it puts you in a position not to be the favorite. You aren't the favorite, but you are in the discussion of tier one for Big Ten Conference Championship run. Like that, that's now a realistic expectation. That wasn't going to be the case, in my opinion, if, frankly, the guy that entered the portal today, Ty Thompson, won the job. Like maybe it does happen. Maybe it develops into that way where they get there, but I don't think with the uncertainty you had at that position that you could realistically say the expectation is you go into the big 10 in year one and the last week of November, you're in the race to win the conference. Like that's unfair. And now that's fair or not. That's where they are in my eyes. Like I know they've got a ton of other holes and we will discuss that. Some of that on this show today, but that's fair or not. Some of their expectations in my eyes now is you have to be, in that discussion at the end of the year to win the conference. So let's go back to Connor's question and start with Matt this time. Um, what is your confidence level with the whole Dante Moore thing? I know that even after Dylan Gabriel announced his commitment, there have been some follow-up reports suggesting Dante will still or could still visit Oregon. What are you, what's kind of, where are you seeing this at? And to the second point of Connor's question here, what do you think they do if they don't get more? Do they just stand pat with what they have? Do they try to find another portal guy? Do they go find another prep? Like, what do you think happens? Knowing what's happened with Dylan Gabriel and now Ty officially going into the portal, you have to go find another one. Um, Dylan's had injuries in the past. Um, and I think... Oregon was very fortunate the last two seasons to go through both years where Bo didn't miss a game because of injury. He got hurt against Washington. He probably wouldn't have finished the game uh, if it was earlier in the year and then, or if it had happened earlier in the, in that 
particular game. Um, I, I think you, you can't go into 2024 with your quarterbacks being redshirt freshman Austin Novosad and true freshman um, Luke Moga. Both guys, developmental quarterbacks, and that's totally fine, but both guys, developmental guys, and you're going to put everything on, all your chips in on Dylan Gabriel. And like I just said, the expectation is that you're in the thick of it for a conference championship. And the pieces are going to be in place where you're going to you're going to have talent and your offense is going to be special. And you have to have someone, if it's a game, if it's two games, or if it's a long stretch of time, you you have a backup playing. Like you, you need someone better than what you got right now. So I think, yes, they go find somebody. I didn't think when a week ago or so, right around now, that Dante Moore and Dylan Gabriel was a possibility. I didn't believe it when we heard it. Um, knowing what we've seen, knowing what I've I've heard, we've done some reporting on on it on DuckTerritory.com. Like it's, it's a very real possibility. Um, I I think Oregon fans, it's unfair to say to expect it, but it's also one that you shouldn't be shocked that it plays out this way. Um, so far, all the dots are connecting. Why would Ty, you know, you could argue Ty could 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 have stayed. Um, mind you, he was paid handsomely from an NIL perspective the last couple of seasons. Um, he was well taken care of, well compensated for the role that he played. And now he has an opportunity to go play, and that's the most important thing. Um, it's not surprising he left, but it also he, – he could have stayed, and – I, it would it would have been a little bit of a shock, but it wouldn't have been the biggest in my mind. Um, you now though, like it's very clear that, that they are in the position here to go get Dante Moore. He's supposed to be on campus this weekend. We don't know of any other visits. Maybe Michigan happens. We'll see what happens with JJ McCarthy uh, if he goes pro. Um, that would be a spot where he could swoop right in and start for an elite team, but he's also been open to, to red shirting. I, I think if you're Oregon, uh, the move makes a ton of sense, especially now that you have Gabriel in play, he's open to red shirting if that's possible. Um, and if you can make it work from a NIL standpoint, from a locker room perspective, and he's clearly got the talent, you got to go all in and, and make this happen. It would be the home run scenario. I don't have a whole lot else to say. I, I think we've made it clear. <laughs> Dylan Gabriel, Dante Moore, like, couldn't ask for a better offseason in the portal from a quarterback position. I, you really couldn't. Um, if it Wait, does, I, got, I got some stuff. Oh, are you still going? Oh, I just – my last thought was I was going to say I, I would be really curious to see if they don't get Dante, who else is in the portal that wants to come and, and, and wait a year, just what that caliber of player is. Um because I, I agree with Matt's point that I do think if if Dante does end up at Michigan or somewhere else that's not Oregon, mm -hmm. I, I would think you'd look long and hard at adding another player to the portal. And I would just be curious to see who that backup plan would be, assuming Dante Moore doesn't end up at Oregon, which I don't know. I kind of sounds like there's a pretty good chance they do this and pull it off. So, uh, yeah, go ahead, Jared. Yeah, they absolutely need to add another quarterback just in general, whether it be Dante Moore, whether it be another prep or a transfer guy, it doesn't really matter. Um, they're only bringing in one after the decommitment from Michael Van Buren, uh, which we talked about last week on this podcast. Another kind of breadcrumb effect of this quarterback development um, all around. And, you know, I, I the the confidence meter for me, at least in the Dante Moore development, is probably like a six. Because it all depends what Dante Moore wants to do. If he's comfortable with sitting behind Dylan Gabriel for a year, then Oregon has heard all of your pleas and cries to develop a quarterback by getting a young quarterback through the transfer portal this time around and no longer doing this constant shopping through the portal for the best quarterback available. Which, you know, it's worked a couple of years in a row now for Oregon and landing Knicks and Gabriel. But yeah, it does make some sense to go and develop your own quarterback, which they're going to do by potentially just poaching UCLA's developmental quarterback that they had last season. But it just depends on Moore. If Moore decides, yeah, I'd like to sit down. I'd like to redshirt. I'd like to learn from Dylan Gabriel. I'd like to get fully enveloped into the offense that Will Stein has. Then 
you have to feel good about, or not even just Will Stein, just fully enveloped into whatever offense the guy picks as his next school. Like you have to feel good about Oregon's chances because there have been breadcrumbs about this for a long time now. Like I remember Cooper Patagna talking about it on uh, his podcast with Andrew Ivins like two months ago, like end of October, like when UCLA first started to have some real problems and Dante Moore was uh, taken out of the starting position. He just kind of threw it out there as like almost a joke that like, oh, what if, what if Dante Moore decides, ah, well, I'm going to go to Oregon like I really wanted to as a high school recruit. Well, here we are with potentially the opportunity for him to do so. Um, and so I, I feel if I'm an Oregon fan, I feel optimistic towards this, uh, a little ecstatic because that could be as good of an offseason as you could really hope for when you have – I feel bad a little bit for Austin Novosad in, in this instance because, um, you know, he'll have to fight out Dante Moore, who I think is a more talented quarterback. But, you know, it's a little bit more – it's exciting for sure, to say the least, for an Oregon fan of this potential scenario playing out. And you have to feel – somewhat above average in your confidence meter just because of all the breadcrumbs that have been laid, what we've talked about on territory.com. And just the idea that this is picking up steam and immediately after Dylan Gabriel's commitment, um, Alan Tree of 24-7 Sports posted his article like, yeah, no, the a visit from Moore to Oregon is still likely. So it, the good news on, on all fronts, at least at this point. And I do think... There's always another side of the coin for the transfer report. We mm -hmm. saw it with Dylan Gabriel. Ty Thompson, like an hour and a half later, posted that cryptic tweet with him yeah. walking away from the Oregon football helmets. And everyone's celebrating the addition of, of, of Gabriel, as they should. But there's also the guy that, that walks away. And I want to bring up the idea here. I don't know what's going to happen. I, I, I don't think this would happen. But... If you add Dante Moore, like to Jared's point, sucks to be Austin Novosad. Maybe he does beat him out because it's not, you know, football is decided on the field. What you do in practice, what you do in games is more important than what happens on paper. But now all of a sudden he's facing a guy in his same class that's more talented than he is. But I know let's go down one more layer. Okay. The, the QB room has completely changed if Dante Moore comes as well. Yeah. What does Akili Smith Jr. do? Because six weeks ago, the idea was, hey, I'm I'm coming in. Uh, Ty Thompson will be the starter for a year or two. And then, or maybe even I, I beat him out. We'll see. Um, and now the job is completely different. Um, Gabriel's here in 2024. You, you assume Dante Moore red shirts. He's a red shirt sophomore when, when Akili Smith shows up. Now, I think if you're Oregon, the easy sell is, hit, hey, like if Dante Moore is as good as we think he is, he's not here for three seasons. He's two years as a starter, maybe one, and then he's gone. And and you get one or two years of waiting, one of which is a redshirt year, and then, then it's your job. Uh, and if he's not as good, that means you have an opportunity to, to take the job from him. But we know high school, you know, we know we've seen this play out before. Guys don't want to wait all the time. Does it cause any kind of, hmm, maybe I need to at least reconsider my options? I don't know. I don't think it would, but it has to at least be – I just want to at least mention it because the QB position, the time to wait is – guys do not do not wait as long as Ty Thompson does historically. I think you kind of outlined what my answer would be with kind of the discussion of how long Dante could be at Oregon for. I mean, Dante could theoretically have one year as a starter and think he's good enough after it to go. Mm -hmm. And that would basically mean Akili waits a season. So um, I don't know in my mind if I'm that concerned with it, in part because of obviously the relationship between the Smith family and the Oregon football program. Um, this is a legacy recruit whose father with the same name was one of the five to six best quarterbacks the school's ever produced, who's grown up wanting to play at Oregon. Uh, I would be really surprised if this if, if that impacted anything, and in, in part because you kind of laid it out there, like Dante Moore's time as a hypothetical starter would have carried about the same amount of time as a Ty Thompson as a hypothetical starter. I guess theoretically maybe one more year. Um, yeah, so I I'm not sure it does a ton, but it'd be interesting. That's something to ask Akili to see if that impacts his decision making at all. But my guess is it 
doesn't. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it should impact his decision making at all. Um, just like Eric said, it could just be one year of waiting. It's also assuming that Achilles Smith is that good, and we That's the other part. Uh, we yeah. know from quarterbacks where, like, I don't want to keep beating Ty Thompson's head over here, but we yeah. know from Ty Thompson, who's the highest rated Oregon QB signee in program history, like, wasn't that he wasn't good enough to win out a starting job over Anthony Brown? No disrespect to Anthony Brown. But, you know, we, we, he could be rated very highly and he could come into camp and not be incredibly good. And maybe um, if Oregon lands another quarterback prospect in 25, that one could be better. And not because of his ratings, but because of his on-field play. Like Matt was mentioning earlier, like if Austin Novosad could just be better than Dante Moore because of how they play on the field, not just from their ratings. So... It's, I think it's still far too early. None of these things have even set into place yet. Um, but it is an interesting question. I just don't think it's going to matter to Akili Smith Jr. because we'll find out if, if, if it really is worth thinking about soon enough. All right, 20 minutes on the quarterback position to open the show. Let's move on and scoot over here to a question from at Formula Designer who asks, with the experience lost on the defensive line, how many players should we get in the portal? A few guys have some experience this year, but a loss of a pass rush is going to expose our secondary. Um, Walter Nolan would be a great addition, but do we need to get a few here? How many? Hashtag Otsnotables. Um, thank you for the question. I believe the first one we've at least read on the show from Formula Designer. They need several. I mean, let me just read through the expected, I don't even know expected, but the possible returners here. Um, Jordan Birch leads the list. I feel a little better about the chance of him coming back now than I did several days ago. There's been some kind of message board rumblings about it. We'll see if that becomes accurate or not. After that, it's like Keon Ware Hudson, Ben Roberts, uh, Terrence Green, Johnny Bowens, Amari Washington, Ashton Porter, uh, Mikhail Gardner. I mean, these are the names that you have after. I mean, not to... I'm not at all being critical of these players, but how many of these guys have played at all at Oregon, right? So the answer is several, like and more than several, honestly. I think three to five at probably is the number, I would say, something like that. Um, and again, if Birch doesn't come back, you, you, maybe that number is more. And, and I, I'm not super, super concerned because Oregon's already been um, attached with some big names. We're talking about Walter Nolan. Obviously, Aiden Breland's a guy coming in. Like, there's talent amongst these guys. I think there's some upside amongst the freshmen and redshirt freshmen and sophomores that we've mentioned already. But you're trying to really compete with the big boys in the Big Ten year one. Yeah, you need some you need some experience here, and you need some probably, honestly, just a little bit more heft in general because a lot of the players here that would be like traditional nose tackles like aren't your 330, 340. Like losing Taki and losing Popo, mm -hmm. those guys who can line up right over the center and kind of overpower them, Oregon doesn't really have – a clear answer right now for that. Um, the closest thing would be like Amari Washington. And he's a guy who played like six, seven games this year and was, I think, fine, but I'm not like jumping for joy. So yeah, no, I, I think you need to find the guy probably at every position and then probably one or two at a couple. I, I think, I think three to five and three might even not be enough um, depending upon some of the outcomes here. Cause if Jordan Birch does put his name in the draft, which he could, you really don't have, anything besides Keon Ware Hudson back in terms of guys who've played meaningful snaps at Oregon. And that's not a great spot you want to be in, especially going into Big Ten play. I think from a portal edition standpoint, I really think it should start at five because of how Oregon runs their system. There was only two guys last season that like averaged more than 30 snaps a game, and that was Jordan Burge and Brandon Dorless. Everybody else was under 30. And they rotated and rotated and rotated. We talked about this ad nauseum over the course of the season. And like Eric just laid out, there's one dude who returns potentially from last year who actually saw a game action. And Keon Ware Hudson was on the bottom of the totem pole in terms of game action, especially towards the end of the year. He was averaging like under 15 snaps a game in the final three games of the season. So you have to have, if you're Dan and you're not adding guys, you have to have a lot of confidence in those that have that are here, in the Amari Washingtons, the Terrence Greens, the Bowens, 
those guys of the world and the Breland and the rushing assume that they sign on December 20th or whenever the signing day is. It's going to be it's going to be difficult because everybody and their mothers needs defensive line help. Um, at least that's how I f- feel about a football program. And Oregon's going to need a lot of them because of this rotation that they've that they've established that I think that's going to carry on because that's what Dan did at Georgia. That's what he did this year when he had the guys to do it with. And it's going to happen in the next couple of seasons. And to Eric's final point, you're moving to the Big Ten. Like You need some big boys. And I know that's like, Ah, uh, the Big Ten, like Big Ten football is lame and boring and stuff like that, which, you know, it can be. It certainly can be. Don't get me wrong. But um, it's not going to be boring if they just demolish Oregon's defensive front with their big old offensive linemen. They're going to be able to put up 20 to 30 points a game because they're going to be able to run the ball like it's nothing. And so that's when you need to get bigger guys. That's when you need to go in and get um, five to six to seven guys out of the portal to solidify your front and say, and just, just bring in competition. Like you may really like the freshman or the redshirt freshman next season, but bring in guys for them to beat and see if they can beat them. And if they can't, well, then you kind of have a better idea about where your team is at because I don't. None of those guys are getting beat last season. So, I think it should start at five. Uh, the bare minimum of number of guys to bring in in the portal. Five is a lot. Um, I think they need to bring in multiple guys, but I don't know if I would go with five. Um, scholarship numbers are going to impact this as well because I mean, if if they were at 72 right now projected scholarship players for 2024 I would be more open to the idea of, of five players but they've got other holes to fill they need receivers they need another quarterback they need safety depth um, we could argue they they could use a tight end as well and um Managing the numbers here is going to be hard for Oregon. Um, but I do agree that it needs to be more than one or two. Um, they played probably, what, like nine guys along the defensive line this season um, on a regular basis, whether that's 15 snaps or guys yeah, like playing, nine, nine or 10 guys, but playing over, over 30. Um, if, if you look at the numbers right now and, and, you say, okay, Jordan Birch is coming back. Keon Ware Hudson and Jake Shipley, that's that's three. Ben Roberts is a guy that, that's played in eight games over two seasons. Um, he will redshirt this season. Um, that's your fourth guy. And then you've got Aiden Breland. The expectation is that he, he plays. Is he going to start? I don't think so. But the expectation, he plays in some, some capacity. Um, that's five. And then you you look at the group of Bowens, Green, Gardner, and Washington, and and you say you, you've probably got two guys there that, that can play. Um, that puts you right around seven. And I think it shows, though, that you need to go out and find experienced players and guys that are productive and that can play in that 20 to, to 35 snap range i don't know if you want to lean on all those freshmen having to play in 20 or 30 um snaps per game uh so i i I would say like closer to two or three guys um and then maybe if there's 10 players we've got a story up on duckterritory.com of 10 players to watch for draft decisions like if all of those 10 go which i don't think happens like the game has changed. You've got more. You've got more availability to add players because if you do have the room, then yeah, I agree with Jared. Go out and find five. Um, but I just don't think with the other needs that they have, that's a luxury they won't be able to afford to, to spend that many scholarships because then it creates deficiency at other spots that also have to get filled. Yeah, I mean, I I agree with you that it may not. It may be too many to ask, but. You can't rely on guys like Ben Roberts or Jake Shipley or Keon Ware Hudson. Like those guys, I mean, Jake Shipley didn't play like the last three games of the season. Ben Roberts redshirted. And if if he already had his he had a redshirt available, so they redshirted him this year. If he were good enough, he would have played because they needed sometimes needed the help at the end of the year with some injuries. And Keon Ware Hudson, you know, had 15 snaps against Oregon State 
a game where you would think his size and his development would really put him into fruition and get him going. But he's, he again, like I said earlier, he was at the bottom of the totem pole. And so that's three of the guys in your seven that you listed where it's like, well, I don't know if we can rely on them. And again, I if rushing and, and Breland sign, I expect them to play. But I don't know what the impact is going to be because I just you just never know what a five stars impact is going to be on the football field. It could be like Mateo, where he's a day one guy, he's a contributing member off the bench, or it could be Jurion Dickey, who gets sixteen snaps or eighteen snaps right. in a season. And so I, that's why I'm I'm adamant towards this. This is going to be my off season thing, like it was last year with the tight end. I'm adamant towards adding guys to this defensive line because. You may have some talent here, but you don't have anybody that's proven other than maybe Birch. And at that point, who knows if he's going to come back, at least as of now. Um, you have talent, but nobody's a proven entity like it was last season where you're bringing in, or you're returning Dorless, Taki, Popo, um, Casey Rogers, like all these guys that you know played from a season ago that have now developed further. So I think it's imperative that they add five guys and they only have to get 85 in like August. So they got some time. The que- the and then I just want to clarify one thing. Like, I don't think Keon Ware or Shipley are going to be 30 snap guys. I'm looking at them as saying they're probably going to be 15 to 20, maybe, maybe a little less than that, but they'll play. And every player has a role. I mean, it's okay that they didn't play this season because, you know, they had so many guys. And there's value in having, you know, a Ben Roberts being able to give you, being the guy that gives you 15 snaps a game. And that's why I said I think they have to go and find guys that are better proven players to pair with the Breland, the Birch. I I think Ben Roberts will be a guy for Oregon next season. He's probably one of my, later on in the question, players who could play in this bowl game that has an impact. Um, But I just wanted to say, I don't think those guys are going to, all of those guys I listed are going to be 30 snap guys because that's just not reality. They're, you know, they have their limitations. That's why they didn't play this season. My last point this is just going to be let's see how good this 2023 defensive line class is, right? Everybody was pretty high on some of these pieces that to, to not get to the number Jared's talking about, they're going to have to feel really good about a Terrence Green or Amari Washington mm-hmm. or Mikhail Gardner, guys who, so the points we've made weren't good enough, weren't able to make a, you know contributions this year. Who knows? Maybe they'll be like, hey, some of these guys were really, really high-end players. We just had better depth, and they're ready to take the step, and we only need three guys or four guys in the portal. Or maybe they go, yeah, well, maybe we need five or six, to Jared's point. I don't know. It's going to be interesting. And the scholarship point is a fair one because for every guy you add, you're going to have to find ways to make room for that. And – they just took a ton of defensive linemen in 23. So theoretically, to make room for that kind of a haul, you're going to have to see probably two or three of these young guys pushed out potentially. So that's the calculus. That's where it gets interesting. It'll be very interesting to see. I think some of this is going to take place post-bowl game in terms of making room for for all of these guys. All right. And we've already seen some of that departure. Uh, Tavita yeah. Pome already went into the portal. And this is a guy that... He didn't spend even a full year out of Oregon. Right. Yeah, going to be more. We know that. Going to be a lot more portal action. Um, we'll get more into portal stuff on the next podcast later this week. We're going to now jump into a few non-portal topics, um, the first of which comes from at Inductrination, who asks, I have heard rumors of Oregon trying to move the Hawaii game next year to Las Vegas. I know teams get a 13th game for playing at Hawaii. What happens if we move it to a neutral site? Hashtag Ots and Audibles. I'm going to send this one right over to Matt because Matt has done some reporting, talked to some folks about this whole Oregon, Oregon State. We'll all call it the Civil War, whatever you want to call it, the, the in-state rivalry game. And it sounds like there's quite a bit of movement towards it being – resumed immediately in 2024 but to do that Oregon's going to have to move some games so why don't you explain some of this on the Hawaii part have you heard this Vegas rumor I don't know if I've seen that really validated from anybody yeah I've I've heard it I I haven't 
been able to get like anyone at Oregon to tell me, yes, this is in the discussion wheelhouse that we're having with Hawaii. But I do also know that uh, that game um, is not a, a lot to happen in Hawaii. I, I, told, oops, I told Eric that um, we joked off air like he's got really excited. He's really excited to go to Hawaii, as we all are, as we all should be to be going to Hawaii. Never been. I'm, I'm in, I've never been to Hawaii, so I was hoping um, to change next year. But yeah, like it's it's on the docket to get chopped. Um, as I've heard the rumor to Vegas, I don't know how. This is where it gets tricky. I don't. The move to Vegas doesn't make sense unless they get a waiver from the NCAA that they still are allowed to play that 13th game, which is awarded to teams playing in the state of Hawaii as a way to offset the cost of playing um, and traveling that far. It's a rule that was initially made for basically the group of five schools that had to go out to Hawaii because it costs like, I think Colorado state a couple of years ago came out and said that um, it, it cost them like $600,000 to play that game in terms of traveling all their, their personnel, traveling all their gear, all their medical staff, everybody to go out there to, to get the hotel rooms, to get the food, and then to fly all the way back um, from Honolulu to Fort Collins. Like that's a huge amount. And so the NCAA made the waiver that if you go there, you get an extra game to be able to offset um, some of the costs. I don't know how, like if, if it's played on the mainland, I don't understand why the NCAA would give the 13th game. And if they don't, okay, so now you have to eliminate a game, which would be probably Idaho, because that's the first traditional week one game for 2024. But now that means you're only playing one game at home. And that's Boise State on the 7th, which is uh, previously the Texas Tech game, but that game has been eliminated. As Eric said, the Civil War will be coming back on the 14th, which is played at Oregon State. So now you're back in a weird place where it's like, do we really want to play one home game? I understand that Oregon is far better than Hawaii. They will win that game, but it's not a home game. And maybe a TV partner shows up or some kind of sponsor shows up to make the game. And the value there is exceeds what a home game would be, which makes it worthwhile for Oregon. But from a money standpoint, but I don't think... Look, Oregon's fan base will show out in Vegas if that happens, but they're not going to sell out Allegiant Stadium like week one against Hawaii. Like that, are they even going to get enough fans to sell out the lower bowl in that stadium? I don't think so. Um, so like, I, I don't, the, unless this waiver gets approved, which I don't know what the, the basis would be. Maybe Hawaii claims, hey, our stadium's not it's currently under renovations so they're trying to add more seats for this Oregon game maybe they come out and cook up some fake reason their stadium's not going to be available due to the expansion for this game for this game so let's go play in, in Vegas I don't know but it's one that it, there's a lot of smoke but like no one has definitely said like yeah Vegas is on the table I've definitely heard Hawaii could get chopped but I don't think Vegas is it, I don't know. It's a weird one. Like, there's enough smoke to make you think it's real, but no one's actually saying it. I don't. I don't understand the point of moving it to Vegas. Like, I don't know why this is. Um, I don't know how the rumor got started in the first place. I don't know why it's as big of a, a big of a thing. It just. It's either like play the game in Hawaii or it's going to get chopped, like you said, Matt. Um, because. Yeah, I guess you can move it to Odson and give them another home game, but I I don't see necessarily the point of continuing to have this game on the schedule other than going to Hawaii, other than having a week zero matchup in Hawaii, and then everybody gets to say, hey, we're going to Hawaii. Um, I would imagine that they try to keep this on the schedule now because of Dylan Gabriel getting to go home to Hawaii for his first game in an Oregon uniform. I think that would yep. be um, – I think that was probably – a recruiting selling point. How important was it? I don't know. Did it make the difference between him deciding between Oregon and another school? Probably not. 
but it's certainly like a cool little thing. Like, hey, Dylan, you get to go play in Hawaii in your first game uh, as an Oregon Duck. So maybe they'd like to keep it on the schedule, but why? Why Vegas? Why is it? Why does it have to be like the neutral side aspect of it? Um, I don't know. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I just had to get that out. I, I don't. I don't get it. Scheduling is. Seems ridiculously hard, but then it's like, oh, no, we can just add Oregon State like this, and there you go. Buy Texas Tech. Have fun playing Washington State because, obviously, they had a weekend open. So, yeah, this one shouldn't be this hard. The the COVID year proved how incredibly easy it is. Like, teams were scheduling games like four days before they were playing. It was a Coastal Carolina. (laughs) It was a BYU. They're like, shoot, Uh, man. Uh, The other – both of our other teams have have COVID, so we need to – Saturday work? Free? Saturday, Saturday yeah, at six. You guys if, gonna uh, if basketball teams can release their current season's thirty-one game schedule in late September for a season that starts in early November, yeah, college yeah. football can easily release twelve games in March before the season yeah. starts. Oh, of course. I mean, I'm waiting on Oregon baseball schedule, and they start February eighteenth or something like that. Okay. So there's you know two months, and they have fifty six <laughs> to sixty games too. Yeah, I so, understand travel and logistics are different for all three sports, but releasing the schedule in February for football gives pl- plenty of ample time for people to make plans for next season. So selfishly, I hope Stupid. this game remains on the schedule and in Hawaii. Okay. Um, yeah. I know the, we won't I, all be paid to go there, but I bet all of us will go there. <laughs> I think we would all be there. Um, I will also add that when I did my feature story on the Lalalu brothers who are from Hawaii, their family was really excited to host as many teammates as possible over for like a huge, big old party. So they were already getting prepared for that. So I'm sure they would be, they would be disappointed certainly if uh, this game just. Yeah. I think uh, I think the people inside the HTC, the, the the actual football program, they probably want this game played in Hawaii. The people that cash the checks and balance the budgets and write the contracts are probably the ones saying, ah, I don't know if this makes financial sense for us to be doing this. As a son of an accountant, I will take full blame for those people. <laughs> All right. Uh, three questions in. <clears throat> Excuse me. Three questions in. Uh, let's take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll wrap up the show. All right, welcome back to the Austin Audible's podcast. Uh, a couple more questions left here in the mailbag. Got one from at Duck Fan Dan who asks, "What does Bonix and other draft eligible players have to gain or lose by playing in the bowl game against Liberty?" Hashtag Austin Audible's. Thanks for the question, Dan. Um, I saw a bunch of different variations of questions about this, so I thought we'd just hit it head on. Um, couple things off the top of my head and I'll pass it on to to Jared. Um, They can gain camaraderie. This this season is not technically over. This can be the last opportunity for these players to play together and for some people that means something. You know, like if you're in a team environment for this long and you have an opportunity to extend it, for some people that's enough. It's like, hey, I want to go out there and play with my teammates, my best friends, my call each other their brothers for a reason. So that, that would be something to gain is an opportunity to do that. I mean, they're Going down to Arizona right around New Year's could, could be a worse place to go. <laughs> um, I think the other part is for a lot of them, um, you're competitive. This is kind of the same kind of an answer, but you want to win a game. This was a special season. They've already won 11. You get an opportunity to go win 12. Like I do think fans don't care about that because unfortunately, and I, th- I say unfortunate because to me it's unfortunate because – once you lose out on playing in the college football playoff, the season is written off, right? And that's done by fans. That's done by certain players, obviously. Sometimes that's done by the coaching carousel where your head coach leaves and so everybody else leaves and so no one plays in the bowl game, um, i.e. Oregon State. Um, but for Oregon, which doesn't have really any of those little examples, like I think there's something to be said of like, hey, we just want to go out there and finish a really special season one last time. So – those are the things to gain. They're all basically like, hey, like it's good for camaraderie. It's good for good competition. Vibes, yeah. yeah, it's vibes more than anything else. Because if you want to talk about what they have to lose, theoretically, 
that's a longer list, especially if there's an injury. I think that's that's the what is to lose component is if you are Troy Franklin and you go play in this game where you've already probably locked up, I don't know, end of the first round, mid second round, somewhere in that range. You can tell me, Jared, if I'm way off base. Why go out there and possibly blow your knee out, miss the entire pre-draft process, and maybe fall to the second or third, or you know, third or fourth round, or whatever it would be? So that's what, to me, you have to win, or sorry, to gain, and what you have to lose. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's much else I can add. Um, I think it's in real life, you probably have a lot more to lose than you have to gain by playing in these games. If you're a real NFL draft prospect, if you're Bo Nix, if you're JPJ, if you're Joy Franklin, if you're Bucky Irving, um, there's certainly some things to gain from this. If you have a monster performance, uh, you know, it's a New Year's Six Bowl game, so there's going to be more eyes on you. But it's not there aren't as going to be as many eyes as the college football playoffs. Um, as maybe some other matchups if this were Oregon and Ohio State or Oregon and Ole Miss or name a team that starts with an O versus Oregon. Um, I, and, the, and to lose, like Eric just went through, like if a guy gets hurt, something like that, like that's could be detrimental because there's only a handful of months to the NFL draft and there's only a handful of months, weeks really until the senior bowls and the training camps and individual workouts and everything like that and you want to be in tip-top shape to go to those things and really showcase yourself there so that's why all these guys elect to to not play and there haven't been there's only been one announcement or i guess technically two with bonex but you know kyrie jackson won't be playing bonex will be playing and there's a lot of other guys who may or may not be playing i think it'll be pretty interesting to see who decides to play because i think it'll be a good barometer of how much dan lanning um has made this team cohesive and feel the togetherness that he's been preaching about all season long. Um, because if guys opt to who opt to play in the game, but go to the NFL, I think that says a lot about the camaraderie and the team building that Dan Lanning has done. And honestly, the shape of the program moving forward. Really the only reason to play is pride and your love for the program. Like you guys just said, and, statistical legacy impacts i mean yeah at least mm -hmm. for Bo, at least there's and Troy. A that's dangling there of going set the record for the most completion percentage in a season or the highest completion percentage in the season you're you're very close to it um it, it could literally be the difference of you going out and just completing 16 of 19 passes which we feel like is very probable for a guy like Bonix to do this season based off what we've seen this season. There's Troy, like, like you said, like go out and expand on the records that you have set for um, your time here at Oregon. Um, Terrence Ferguson's a guy that has to make a decision and that carrot for the most receptions in a game is, or in, in a season for a tight end is, is out there. So um, I, I think that, the overwhelming one is what Jared said, the love for your teammates, the love for this program. And then for some of these guys, there's the, the lasting legacy of their individual achievements to, to you know, to crown, you know, put the cherry on the top per se of, of a, a magical season, a special season for themselves. And we should note, we'll start probably learning more on some of these decisions in the next week or so, or probably this week, I would imagine, just because Dan did say that they were taking last week off and that they jump back into practice this week. And I imagine once you start getting back into practice shape, you are you know who's out there and the players who yeah. aren't are going to start making those kind of announcements known. So I would expect in the next 24, 48, 72 hours, we'll have a little better idea of who's, who's opting in and who's opting out, which would help us with this next question, but we will have to play off some assumptions here with the question from at Bigfoot8801 who asks, what underclassmen... Do you expect to have a breakout game versus Liberty? Obviously, the point I just made is true here of we're going to have to assume one way or the other on a couple. One position where there is not a lot of assumptions is cornerback. So I would start right there and say this could be a, good, a big Roderick Pleasant game, perhaps. Um, we already know Kyrie's not playing. Triquist Bridges has entered the portal. And Jaleel Florence, as we talked about, I don't know. He might not play in this game, too. That injury could hold him out for a minute. I'm not sure if we're going to get much clarity on that one or not. But um, 
because that you could be Oregon could be without three of its top five corners for this game. I would think you would see Dante Manning retain his starting spot for the game. Maybe Nico Reed moves into a starting spot or could be Roderick Pleasant. So that would be a name to throw out offensively. If we, if we assume Troy Franklin's not playing, it becomes easier to pick a receiver or two. Um, if we, you know, if we were to assume Bucky Irving's not playing, you could talk about one of the true freshman running backs, but we really don't know. So it's harder. Um, but corner right now is the position where you know for a fact a couple of guys aren't going to be available. So I think that's the easy place to start. Um, I'll toss it over to you guys for just some other names maybe you're watching. Yeah, I don't – it's going to help in like two weeks yeah. maybe when we know like who's coming in or who's going out. Um, like The first guy was Jordan James to come to my brain, but we already know who and what Jordan, brain, Jordan, geez, Jordan James does uh, on the field. So Dante Dowdell, Jaden Lamar, probably more Jaden Lamar than Dowdell, um, just because that's a kind of seems what the hierarchy and the depth chart has been this season, which I thought yeah. was has always been interesting, but mm -hmm. there's never been a case where it's actually mattered. Um, yeah. This is probably going to be the the case where it does, because I don't know, I, I don't anticipate Bucky Irving to play. If he does, then all of this is utterly useless. So cool, but there's not a lot of great options right now. Probably dudes on the defensive line, but there's still like I, Brandon Dorless is going to be a draft pick, but I'd imagine he plays like Casey Rogers and Taki like yeah, guys are leaving, well, well. but they're going to play. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. Jordan James, one of the true freshman running backs, like Eric said, I don't, I don't have a lot of good options here. I think this is a very easy answer. Ooh. It's, it's on the defensive side of the football. It's the first one's what Eric said, cornerback. Um, and then the second one is what just Jared was, I was hoping was going to talk himself into it's defensive line. Casey Rogers, Popo, Taki, Dorless. Um, those guys, I, I agree. I think they're all going to play, but I also think they're going to play in limited amounts. They're not going to um, play their normal amounts of football. We don't know the injury status, by the way, of Jordan Birch. He was in a, yeah, a, a sleeve and a knee, a knee brace uh, after the Vegas game and against Washington didn't play after that. Um, is he healthy enough to play? Is it worth – if he's coming back next season, or regardless of what he's doing, is it worth him playing, having an injury to the knee a month ago um, by the time this game is played? I, I don't know. So I, I think we're going to see hockey changes, uh, shift changes along the defensive line. I think we're going to see a lot of Johnny Bowens, Terrence Green, Mikhail Gardner, Amari Washington. We're going to see Ben Roberts. Um, they're going to use this as an opportunity to get these guys onto the football field and see what they can do in game-like situations. Because if this game goes as it should, when if everyone plays that's expected to play, um, or even if like even if Bucky and Troy don't play, okay, like maybe let's say those two with and Kyrie Jackson are the guys that opt out of this bowl game. And it, there could be more. It wouldn't shock me if there's more. But let's just say that's kind of the three that, that, that don't play in this game. Oregon should still steamroll this Liberty team, and it should be over by halftime based off of the talent gap that they have with these two teams. Like that, You should be able to create a situation where you can start rotating these freshmen in and – you're giving a good send off with a victory with your seniors and these other guys can protect their, you know, their health by playing limited amounts. I, I think the defensive line is going to rotate a lot. Um, and I think we could see some, some of that also happen along the offensive line, at least with Poncho and JPJ. Um, Cause I don't, this is another one of the, the previous question. Like I think JPJ should be, should be off the NFL after this season. I don't think he needs to prove anything else. Maybe you know, maybe he does want to, to come back because he does love Oregon so much. He loves his team so much. But this is a good opportunity to get Poncho some reps at center as well. So I, I would think defensive line and corners, the first two positions to watch. But one point to, to kind of make here, I think we've made it on the show before, but the the red shirt rules don't apply with this game. Mm -hmm. So someone like Jury on Dickey, there's I think there's three or four guys who are locked at the the four game threshold right now. Playing in the bowl game doesn't impact that. They are, have already preserved their redshirt year. So 
that's something to monitor. Well, I think Don, uh, Dan has even mentioned that that could be um, something that they'll take advantage of. But like Jurion Dickey is a name to kind of know, but I'm also like if Troy doesn't play, he's probably still fourth on the depth chart. And Oregon basically, oh, he might be fifth. Might be fifth, probably fifth, actually, the more I think it through, depending on how, what Gary's availability is. Um, it's just, I don't know if you see, I, I, I'd love to pick him because I know Oregon fans listening are probably like, we want to see him play. Are, are we going to? I don't know. And maybe to Matt's point, maybe this does get out of control early and the whole second half is Austin Novosad and Dante Dowdell and Jerry and Dickey and the fans get their, their wishes and they get to watch all the right. true freshmen. But um, we'll it's a good it. Liberty Liberty team, folks. Thirteen say, and zero. They're actually their their offense is one of the best in the nation. Oh. They've made actually, zero competition. A hundred and thirty of one hundred and thirty three strength schedule. Like oh yeah, I, I thirteen and zero. You have to applaud that. Yes, absolutely. But the talent gap is as big as the Grand Canyon between these two teams. And if Oregon shows up to play. Liberty could play an A-plus game and still lose by three scores. I think that's probably we'll about, out, yeah. Yeah, that's probably about right. I, I, uh, I'm I excited, at least. We haven't done any Liberty talk. I, Caden Salter, no. I'm at least excited to see him play. I mean, one of the true yeah. dual-threat quarterbacks in the country, ran for over 1,000 yards, was really effective passing. Excited to see him yeah. play, at least. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, that's going to do it for us here on the mailbag. Thanks for submitting the questions. If you didn't get yours in today, send it again. Uh, or maybe Eric's just save a bunch of those because we got a bunch. Um, and we'll do another mailbag here coming up next week. But until then, you've been listening to the Odds and Audibles podcast. Talk to you later, folks. Peace.